Hello everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel, Homeopathy Super Sessions by Dr. Jagos. Today, we'll do the second part of the brief life and contributions of the early pioneers after Harriman. Today, I'll be discussing the great Dr. James Tyler Kent. So he had quoted, they are general, common and peculiar symptoms. The general is used in the sense of general of an army and the general commands all other symptoms and really controls the patient. So basically, he says that in symptomatology, there are the general symptoms, the common symptoms, and the peculiar symptoms or the peculiar symptoms. And they can be compared to the general of the army. He commands all, <clears throat> he commands the full army, and all other symptoms really control the patient. So the generals basically. Just like the general of the army, he commands the full army. Even the general symptoms, basically, they cover up or they command the rest of the symptoms also. So basically, the general symptoms are more important as compared to the common and the peculiar symptoms. So Dr. Jack James Tyler Kent was born in Woodhull, New York, in the United States of America on 31st March 1849 into a Baptist family. His father was Stephen Kent and his mother was Caroline. He graduated from Franklin College in Prattsburg and then continued his studies at the academy of his native town. His higher education continued at the University of Madison in Hamilton, where he obtained the degree of Bachelor of Physiology at the age of 19 years in 1868. In 1870, he obtained the MA degree from the Bellevue Medical College. 1871, he completed medical studies at the Institute of Electric Medicine in Cincinnati, Ohio. Thus, at the age of 25 years, he passed his final examination and received his license to practice medicine. Early medical practice, he started his professional career as an electric, eclectic physician in St. Louis in the state of Missouri. At the age of 28 years, he was professor of anatomy at the American College of St. Louis. He soon, he soon started making a name for himself through several articles published in eclectic medical journals and he became a leading member of the National Association of, of Eclectic Medicine. Dr. Kent's life now is conversion to homeopathy. <clears throat> Dr. Kent's life took a turn towards homeopathy after his marriage. His wife Ellen in 1878 was very sick. She was suffering from neurasthenia, weakness, persistent in insomnia and anemia. The eclectic treatment as well as allopathic treatment was unsuccessful in curing her insomnia. So Dr. Ken became very dissatisfied with his own therapeutic system. When her condition became worse, she asked Dr. Ken to call a homeopath. First, Dr. Ken did not agree, but considering her condition, he later on agreed. The homeopath, Dr. Richard Fellon, was called. Dr. Richard Fellon, with his white beard and black coat, came one afternoon in his carriage took a detailed history for more than an hour. The questions he asked seemed to be silly and unrelated to her illness. Dr. Kent could not help laughing and was smirking behind his moustache as he stood near her bed. So since Kent did not believe in homeopathy, he started making fun of Dr. Richard Fellon, who started taking a case for more than one hour. And furthermore, the questions which Dr. Richard Fellon asked were seemed to be silly and unrelated to her illness. Just like in homeopathy, we ask all the cravings, the aversion, the mental makeup, and so on and so forth, which has basically no relationship to the disease. Dr. Kent found it very amusing and was and was and was quietly laughing or smirking behind his mustache. Dr. Fellin examined and asked her and asked for a glass of water. He poured a few minute globules in the glass and gave a spoonful to Mrs. Kent. He advised her to take a spoonful from the glass every two hours till she felt drowsy. So this was the way in which Dr. Fellan gave the medicine. He dissolved it in water and was supposed to take it every two hours. Kent thought the homeopath to be an imposter. So Kent thought that Dr. Fellan was really a quack or an imposter because for several weeks she had not slept. And now she was expected to get rid of her insomnia after taking some tiny globules dissolved in water. So Kent said that, <clears throat> Kent thought that for all these days, or, or weeks she could not sleep and how suddenly she will be able to sleep by some tiny globule dissolved in water. 
two hours later, Kent gave her second uh, the second dose and went to the study to prepare for his lecture. But Kent had no choice, so he gave the medicine, he gave the first dose, he gave the second dose, and after giving the second dose, he went to the he went to prepare for his lecture. Dr. Kent was so engrossed in his work and he forgot to administer the third dose. Four hours later, he suddenly remembered and was surprised to notice that his wife was asleep. After this, Dr. Fellan was called several times for consultation and the and the, and the condition gradually improved. Within a few weeks, she completely recovered. The homeopathic medicines given to her were pulsatilla and sulfur. So according to symptom similarity, according to protected symptoms, pulsatilla was given. And when the when the, when, when the symptom order came to the totality of sulfur, sulfur was given. So these two remedies were used in the treatment, pulsatilla and sulfur. Dr. Kent was very impressed and since he was an honest man, he apologized to Fallon for his bad behavior. So Dr. Kent was very upright, was very honest and he he apologized to Dr. Fallon for his bad behavior. The cure of his wife moved him so deeply that he decided to learn more about homeopathy. So this was the turning points in Kent's life for his conversion to homeopathy. Seeing his wife become, wife became all right, he started uh, learning about homeopathy. Under the guidance of Dr. Fellan, he studied Hahnemann's organ medicine. He worked day and night and 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 read and read all he could. He also resigned from the post of, of anatomy lectureship and the, mem and the membership of Eclectic National Medical Association. From then on, he practiced homeopathy. So later on, he resigned from his post and he started practicing homeopathy. Now, important contributions number one or A educational contributions. In 1881 to 1889, he became professor of Matra Medica at the Missouri Homeopathy Medical College. 1890 to 1899, he was a dean at the Philadelphia Postgraduate School of Homeopathy. He taught homeopathy philosophy, repertory, and Matra Medica. He had a busy private practice and he, and he saw more than 18,800 patients in 1896 and 16,000 patients in 1897. So this was a very huge amount of patients that Dr. Kent was seeing and was treated with homeopathy. In 1903, he became Dean of Dunham Homeopathy Medical College in Chicago. He was also a professor of homeopathic philosophy, repertory and mathematical college. Later on in 1903, he also became Dean of the Hanimanian Homeopathic Medical College in the same city. 1909, Kent joined Herring Medical College. Under his guidance, college opened reputation of being the best of its kind. He taught medical specialties, how to analyze and lay stress on the significance significant symptoms in a patient. Other doctors who were taught who taught in the college were Dr. H. C. Allen, Dr. J. H. Allen, Dr. C. Lippi, Dr. Herring, Dr. Hempel, Dr. Dungeon, Dr. Dunham, and Dr. Wieselhoff. Now be the, the introduction of high potency. This is also important because in the Viva they may ask you, okay, Kent was known as a high potency prescriber. Why? Or why did Kent start prescribing high potency? What incident made him prescribe a high potency? Initially, Ken practiced with low potencies but was dissatisfied. Later, he resolved to test the 30 potency to see if there was any medicine in it. He prepared with his own hands 30 potency of podophyllum. The preparation was made with water according to centesimal scale as per the method of Hanneman, having been told that water was as good as alcohol. An incident in his clinic convinced him about the power of potentized medicine. One dose of podophyllum caused, caused cured and dangerous child suffering from diarrhea. So one day in his clinic, a small child had come, or rather an infant had come with a mother who had suffered from diarrhea. And the diarrhea was so sour and it, and it was so, and it was so, so smelling badly that from the next, in the waiting room, Kent could smell the odor of the diarrhea. So, one dose of podophyllum cured him. So, Kent gave the infant a dose of podophyllum and told the mother to report the next day. But... The mother did not come, so the Ken thought that the child must have died. And uh, and 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 so one day, after maybe after a few days, after a week or two, in the market he, he met his mother, and he said that, uh, and he asked the mother, how was the child? So how was the infant? So mother said, oh doctor, there was no problem. After the one dose what you had given, the child was completely all right. So hence I did not come to you. Thus, <clears throat> Dr. James Tyler Kent, his belief in high potency was, uh, you can say, was stamped, and he advocated the use of high potency, namely the 38 
200, 1M, 10M, 50M, CM, and MM potencies, which were made on the septicemal scale. Hence, he became famous as a high potency prescriber. He also introduced the doctrine of series and degrees in the treatment of in the treatment of chronic disease. Series of degrees meaning what? He found out that one potency was not sufficient to cure the case. It would generally do for acute diseases, but for chronic diseases, you had to go on giving the series and degrees that is 30 to 100, 1 m, 10 m, and so on and so forth. The doctrine of series and degrees. Thus, to cure the chronic diseases, the doctrine of series and degrees was un was fully uh, was fully understood and used. So as I told you, in a chronic case, many many uh, many potencies are required, so, which was known as series in degrees to cure the case. Dr. Ken discovered that just as they are octaves or musical notes, so they are octaves, the simple substance through which severally it is possible to correspond with the various planes of the interior organism of the animal, animal cells. These planes correspond to the similar remedy 38, 200, 15, and 15, CM and MM potency. So he says that in the series of degrees, just as there are, they are different octaves in the musical in the musical notes, so similarly in the simple substance also, there are several octaves and they correspond to the interior of the organism or the animal cells and they are similar to the remedies in the, in the required potency of 30, 200, 1M, 10M, 50M, MM and so on. He found out that when the action of 30th was completed, the patient needed the 200 potency to keep it under the remedial action for a time. So he found out that after the 30th potency, <clears throat> the action was completely over or, or the action was completed. Then only the next potency was needed by the patient. So in, in this way, he went on uh, increasing the potency. But when the action of 200 was exhausted, the patient required one name of the same remedy and the highest potency is cured him permanently. So in, in the similar fashion, he found out that when the next potency was given and it is exhausted action, then the next higher potency was required. So therefore, he went for 30th potency, 200 potency, uh, 1M potency, 10M, 50M, CM, and M potency. He discovered the law of action and vital reaction as pointed out by Dr. Henneman in a more definite manner. The law of vital action and reaction. <clears throat> Dr. Kane discovered the law of vital action and reaction as pointed out by Dr. Henneman in a more definite manner. The law states, the medicine is not too high to cure so long as it is capable of aggravating the symptoms belonging to the sickness in the first hours in acute and in the very few days, the very first few days of a chronic illness. So, he said that when you give a homeopathic, med potentized homeopathic medicine in a particular potency, then <clears throat> in an acute case, the aggravation will take place in the first few hours. Whereas in a chronic phase, in a chronic case, it will take place within the first few days. He also found that the aggravation is, is essential for the application of similarum in the chronic case. So he said that the homeopathy aggravation, he said, was quite essential or a must, especially when treating a chronic case. If there is relief without homeopathy aggravation, the chronic illness is superficially affected and would require more deep act remedy to remove the vital disorder. So Dr. Kane said that if, however, while treating a chronic case, you do not get homeopathic aggravation, it, it, it indicates that whatever remedy was given was a superficial acting remedy. You haven't covered the whole totality in depth and a more deep acting remedy has to be given in order to remove the vital disorder. The evaluation of patient symptoms. He emphasized on the values of mental symptoms. He was influenced by psychiatrist Dr. Swedenberg stress the concept of the mind as a key to the human personality. Dr. Swedenberg introduced the importance of psychosomatic component of disease, Glenn classified mental symptoms into four main groups. So, as you all know, Kent gave great importance to the mental symptoms because he came under the influence of a psychiatrist, Dr. Swedenberg. <clears throat> and he stressed the importance, or Swedenberg has stressed the importance of psychosomatic component of the disease. And therefore, can classify symptoms into four main groups. And these four groups, I have to tell you, are, are the symptoms pertaining to the emotion, to the, uh, to, sorry, to the will, to the emotion, to the intellect, and the subconscious. And between the uh, will and the emotions, you get the apprehension of perception, the illusion, delusions, and hallucinations. So the four main groups he had classified. Now, proving of 
proved many drugs of homeopathy. Dr. Ken proved many new medicines which he had described in his book, New Remedies, Clinical Cases, Lesser Writings, Aphorism and Percepts in 1916. This book was published 10 years after his death in 1926. Another popular writing was what the doctor needs to know in order to make a successful prescription in the year 1900. Kent introduced synthetic prescriptions of many drugs. So he had Kent also, this is in the Viva, they'll ask you who proved synthetic prescriptions or who advocated synthetic prescriptions. The answer is Dr. James Taylor Kent. And remember at least a few names like Alumina Phosphorica, Alumina Silicata, Aurum Asara Arsenicum, Aurum Iodatum, Aurum Sulfuratum, Baritum, Barium Iodatum, Barium Sulfuricum, Calcareous Silicata, Centuries Contro. Contoctix, ferrum arsenic, kali salt, natum salt, natum salicylicum, vespa vulgaris, and zinc, zinc phosphoricum. So if you remember two, three remedies, what you can. He wrote two pamphlets, what a physician should know in order to select a homeopathic drug, that's a 20-page booklet, how to study and use the homeopathic remedy and article. He also was the editor of two important homeopathic journals, namely the Journal of, of Homeopathists from 1897 to 1903, and the Homeopathicians from 1912 to 1916. He was a member of reputed societies, namely the President, Trustee of Chicago Homeopathic Hospital, member of Illinois State Homeopathy Medical Society, member of American Institute of Homeopathy, member of the International Hanuman Association, honorary corresponding member of the British Homeopathy Medical Society, the Society of Homeopaths, which he himself had founded. Other important literary contributions were a synopsis of homeopathy philosophy. It was a 31-page booklet revised and comp compiled by, by R. Gibson Miller, Repetitive Homeopathy Medica in 1897, Letters of Homeopathy Philosophy in 1900, What the Doctor Needs to Know in Order to Make a Successful Prescription in 1900, Letters of Matra Medica with New Remedy in 1905, Use of Repetitive, How to Study the Repetitive, Kent's Expanded Repetitive, and More for the Patient. Now something about Kent's second wife. Because why was so they will ask you how many wives can I mean how many wives did Kent have and what and what happened to the second wife or how was the second wife cured? In 1896, Kent, Kent lost his wife. He had a flourishing practice, and during that time, he was called upon to see a patient, Clara Louise Toby, who was a practicing physician. She had considered the most celebrated homeopathic doctor in America, and all of them had prescribed lacases. So this is how we came in contact with this second wife. Patient Clara, Cara Louis Toby, who was a practicing physician, and all the doctors, all the great doctors in, in America who were homeopathic doctors prescribed legacies. Dr. Kent noted the history, studied the case with great care, and finally concluded that she had been manifesting a proving of legacies for many years. So Kent came to the conclusion after the history is that, that since every physician had given her given him given her legacies, she started, she was basically proving legacies. Thus, she finally got the atrogenic mechanism of lacassis and predicted that she would have to have, would, would have the symptom all her life. So, Kent diagnosed it as an atrogenic mechanism of lacassis or a drug induced mechanism. Thus, for the rest of her life, she had to antidote, he had to antidote the drug proving. It was interesting to know that she survived to the age of 91 and died in the year 1943. So, in spite of, in spite of the lacassis, a deep acting polycrest being proved on her, she lived. For, for quite a long time, right to the age of 91 years. Now, death of Kent. <clears throat> Due to overwork, Kent's health deteriorated. His wife and students forced him to go for holiday to Stevensville in Montana. As soon as he arrived, the catarrhal bronchitis from which he had been suffering for months turned into pride disease. After two weeks of illness, he died on 16th of June, 1916. So, that's all for this part. So, this is Kent's contribution. Again, important. You must know also the year of death, year of birth, year of death, conversion to homeopathy, then the, the then the important contributions and why was Kent known as a high potency prescriber and what Kent died of and how did Ken come in contact with this second wife and what was the second wife suffering from? Thank you so much.